everyone. My name is Anita Heiss. I'm a Wiradjuri woman from central New South Wales, and I'm your MC for today. And I'd like to welcome you to the Healing Foundation's Healing and Mental Health webinar. Before we go any further this morning, I'd like to welcome Uncle Chicken Madden, a Gadigal elder who will give a welcome to country. Folks, I'm from Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. I'd like to take this opportunity this morning to extend a warm and sincere welcome to all of my Aboriginal brothers and sisters, non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters who may have travelled here to Gattaca land. If we have any brothers and sisters from the Torres Strait or further or far across the seas, welcome. Welcome to Gattaca land. I'd like to introduce the Healing Foundation CEO to you right now, Richard Weston, who's going to offer a few welcoming words. Thanks, Anita, and welcome to everyone in the audience today and, and our online audience. And thank you, Uncle Chica, for, uh, for a fantastic welcome. It is great to be here on Gadigal land. Um, and it's, uh, I guess it's, it's quite poignant to be in this place um, where the First Fleet started off. And uh, today we're talking about mental health and healing. And it's great to be here with Anita, Joni, Preston, Shondell, and Justin to talk about these issues in our communities. As chair of the National Mental Health Commission, Professor Alan Fells said last week at the National Press Club, and I quote, this is important business. And while Australia has a good health system by international standards, it has two profound weaknesses, mental health and indigenous health, to which mental health is a very significant component. Mental health needs to be a priority for governments and the community at all levels, end of quote. Colonisation, intergenerational trauma and grief manifest in many ways. Beyond the impact on the individual, trauma can have a significant impact on the organisations where people work or volunteer or from where they seek support. The trauma that our people experience is often seen as a mental health issue rather than an accumulation of deep loss and grief. Mental health systems have often been unresponsive to the healing needs of our people and have not understood their trauma. Healing is about acknowledgement and recognition of people's distress, both individually and as a collective. And this acknowledgement is essential to recovery. Healing is a view of wellness and recovery rather than sickness. It is a strengths-based approach. To assist our communities to build healthy trauma-informed organisation and healthy workforces, the Healing Foundation has developed a report called Healing Informed Organisations. An organisation can be ad adversely affected by the trauma behaviours of its staff, members of its governance group and their clients. And without appropriate strategies, this combination can lead not only to stress and burnout for individuals, but have a significant impact on the healthy functioning of an organisation as a whole. We have copies of the Healing Informed Organisations on the table at the, front of the org of, at the front of the auditorium here. And if you are online, you can download this from our website. So please take a copy with you. Um, and we look forward to our panel discussion today. And again, welcome our panellists and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. In mind, it's my pleasure now to introduce you to our speakers, Joan Dixon, Preston Campbell, Shondell Bolt and Justin Files, who will take some time as individuals to tell their own stories, but collectively they will discuss a range of themes and experiences from personal journeys of struggle and inner strength to the roles of community and healthcare services in assisting positive health outcomes for our people. Thank you, Nita. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge that the land we meet on today is the traditional home of the Gadigal people. And I thank Uncle Chica for his very warm welcome. And I also pay my respects to the spiritual relationship that the Gadigal people have with this country. I also pay my respects to all Aboriginal people who have made this land their home. To the elders past who have shown us the way to elders present who continue to guide us, and to elders to come, the youth that I work with, who will continue the legacy. Sorry, technology. Belonging to country and connecting to our kinship groups has been an instrumental component of our family and community strength. 
in two Western New South Wales communities. The forced removal of these connections continue to impact on the wellbeing of individuals, families and the community. Burke, located on the banks of the Darling River, has an estimated population of 3,000 people. The medium age is 35, however the Indigenous population is 30%. Bawarana, located on the banks of the Barwon River, the site of the magnificent fish traps, has an estimated population of 1,800 people. The medium age is 32, and the population is over 60% 60, 60 of the population. The, popula the trauma resulting from the forced removal of people from the lands around those two communities into government-run missions in Bawarana and later Burke has resulted in increase in mental health, illnesses being identified in these two communities. Between 2008 and 2015, mental health services provided in partnership with general practice was in excess of 7,500 occasions of service, with many of these people seeking help following police, child protection or corrective services involvement. As stated in the report prepared by the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Women's Task Force on Violence, many Aboriginal people have suffered profound violation in their childhood and have endured decades of oppression and neglect. The massacres and inhumane treatment of their families remain fresh in our minds. Many members of contemporary Indigenous communities can still remember the policies that isolated them from the broader community and that exempted them from associating with family and kin, and that forcibly removed them as children and subjected them to treatment that breached even the most basic human rights. The understanding of the connection between emotional trauma in childhood and illness in adults was a key theme of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study in America. This major study analysed the effects of traumatic trauma experiences in the first 18 years of life on the 1,700 individuals and their adult mental, medical, sexual behaviour and health costs. The ACE study had 10 categories. Each of those categories identified a number of different themes that would, um, would help to identify the types of abuse. And abuse was broken up into three categories, emotional, physical and sexual. Family violence was another issue, drug and alcohol, removal from family, one or more parents in custody, one or more parents with mental health illnesses, physical neglect and emotional neglect. These key themes are resonant in our own Australian society and particularly with our Indigenous community. The study highlighted that 54% of the population that was surveyed had depression and that 58% had attempted suicide in particular over 50% um, of the women who participated in the survey had, one or, um, had five or more categories that they had been subjected to as a child. So what happens when people experience trauma? They have altered brain and central nervous system neurology they will have depression and anxiety. Our kids have started to have behavioural problems at school, cognitive delays, delayed gross motor and visual perception skills, speech delays, short-term memory loss. They have uncharacteristic aggression towards their, their siblings. 
they can have hyperarousal and hypervigilance. Some of our kids have lock, l lack of concentration and focus. And inappropriate behaviour, hurting animals, hurting siblings, destroying property. And unfortunately, five times um, more likely to be in the child protection system and 15 times more likely to commit suicide. So from 2001 to 2010, the rate of ATSI people or our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people was twice the rate of non-Aboriginal people, with our Aboriginal youth, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander youth being most at risk. Men between, aged between 15 and 19 were 4.5 or 4.4 times more likely to complete suicide. And females between 15 and 19, 5.9. Reviews of research by Evans and colleagues in 2005 suggested that a strong link exists between physical and sexual abuse and attempted suicide, which is occurring during adolescence. A quote from the Break the Silence report says, this, it stole me. I lost myself. He took me away and I am here today, a shadow of the person I could have been because he took it away from me. And I can never get that person back. And society, to want to pretend that it doesn't happen, and this is where and why we are still victims. And they are making us so. Risk factors that... Um, that include, um, are in our communities, are chronic trauma, substance abuse, poor relationships, poverty. In the t past 12 months, in the two communities that I've spoken about, five young people have taken their life. These young people were younger than 19. All had extensive trauma, and all were local to the, their respective communities. So healing in Burke and Bawarana came about by the recognition of, from elders that past removal practices had um, contributed to the disintegration of families. Whilst many school-based programs work with students to address incident-specific topics, such as a Love Bites program, and elders within the community said, we want healing for our, our mob. And that we want it community-driven and evidence-based. Family and Community Services data reports that 54.1% of children in out-of-home care in Western New South Wales are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. And that children between the ages of 7 and 11 were the highest group in care. 43% of our young people are in custody and we're less than 2% of the population. And up to 19 and 25% respectively for males and females on any given day are in our jail system. However, we make up 1.5% of the population. These two communities have repeatedly topped the state in the BOSCAR stats for the highest rates of domestic violence and sexual assault. And although work has been done in many communities around alcohol and responses to alcohol-fuelled violence, alcohol-related incidences, including domestic violence, are still the highest in the state. So what did we do? In conjunction with the Healing Foundation, Burke High School and the Burke community Bawarana Central School and the Bawarana community 
decided to implement the inter Intergenerational Trauma Project. The project school with school-based integrated lessons are held weekly with years seven and eight. These groups are divided into men and women's groups and each of the groups has an opening healing circle. It's led by Aboriginal people and those Aboriginal people are enabling the children to grow and develop. They're providing positive cultural identity. They're providing mentor and leadership. And these people are starting to identify when things are starting to become too bad for them in the classroom and remove themselves. One of the things that will happen later in the year is that family camps will be held to enable families as as part of this process. Our elders come into our school regularly and continue to play a major role in the lives of these young people. The outcomes that we've seen so far, and the program started in April this year, is we've seen an improved ability by the community to address trauma-related behaviours. School teachers now talk about trauma in welfare meetings. Children are given opportunities to remove themselves from classes where previously their behaviours would have meant suspension. These young people are starting to take pride in themselves and in their family and in their community and engage with younger members of their sibling group and their peer group. It's also provided the community with tools to address trauma and also enable people to heal that is locally designed and delivered by local people. And it's given hope back to young people in Burke and Brewarana. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Uncle Tika, for the uh, welcome. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people as well. Um, and thank them for their contribution, not just the Gadigal people, but the people of all, all of Australia, both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands, for their commitment, past commitment, and to the present elders, um, the continuing commitment and con contributions to our community. Um, it's, I think it's important that we acknowledge that, given the, the position we are as in, in Indigenous people in Australia right now, um, guys like Uncle Chica, and people up before him kicking doors down for us to be able to have the opportunities that we that we're allowed today. Um, if you don't mind, I, I like to tell stories. Um, giving us ten minutes of which is going to be pretty difficult. Um, I myself, I'm a, I'm a Gomeroy man. Now, I grew up in my mum's country, uh, Northern Tablelands of New South Wales, a um, little place called Tinga. I was born in Inverell. Thing is that small, it doesn't have an hospital. Um, I grew up there until I was 19. And I wandered off to, um, to the Gold Coast to pursue a career in rugby league. Now for me, not many people uh, know that I didn't want to be a rugby league player. That's, that was not on the, my top 10 list of, um, of careers. I myself, I wanted to be a teacher growing up. Um, I had a great experience in school, in primary school in particular. I have um, great memories. You know, I can remember all my school teachers in every year coming through primary school. And it was just a great time for me. I mean, school teachers were, were very cool and I wanted to be a school teacher. The way things went for myself, um, things sort of fell into place. I uh, really had no choice. I, myself and my partner, um, we were expecting a baby while I was still in school. Um, so quite young and not really knowing what I had to do, I had nothing, nothing sort of lined up for myself after school, so an opportunity to play rugby league came up and I basically took it with both hands. And I myself used my, um, used my daughter to be as drive to make a career in rugby league. Uh, it was something that pushed me. Um, it was something that drove me to be successful, 
to achieve something. Um, it was something that I didn't see a lot in my community growing up um, with my family, with my friends. Um, it was something where, and it's in a lot of our communities where our men are kind of lost, lost their way in community. Um, and for me, I didn't want to. I didn't want to lose my way. I wanted to be that support. I wanted to be that that pillar for my family. I myself had a great great father. The mere fact that he hung around, he brought in food, gave us a roof over our head, makes him my hero. Um, seen a lot of people in my community that didn't have that privilege. It was was kind of upsetting and a little sad. And it was something that. Um, kind of stuck with me all the way through my footy career. I played rugby league um, at the highest level for 14 years. Um, and the pressures of, rug of rugby league was something that got to me. Um, yeah, you have people put you up on a pedestal, um, and it's kind of good to be put up there. Um, but sometimes you really forget what it is you're there for. And for me, I was lost in, in the footy, in the bright lights. And there came a time where there was a little few changes um, in the scenery of rugby league for myself, um, clubs, and it wasn't anything major. Um, but at the time, for me, this little bit of change, this little bit of fear sort of came into me. And I struggled big time. I struggled massively to the point where I just felt like I couldn't be around anymore. Um, I often say I don't, I don't think anybody really wants to die. I, I know myself, I didn't really want to die. But for me, for the pain to stop and for the hurt to stop, the only way I felt that I can get rid of that, that I can stop that, was to take my own life. Yeah, now that's something I'm not, I'm not proud of, but it's something I'm open with, I'm honest about because I know with my story, with my journey, I've been able to help so many people that have had the same struggles as myself. Even though I was a professional footballer, doesn't mean I'm any different from anybody else that's not a professional footballer. Um, I do a lot of work in many remote communities um, and the struggles. Like the speaker before said, it's just, it's ridiculous how, how many of our people out there are struggling with this thing we call mental illness. Um, I myself, I think like a lot of people, until I really went through it, I experienced it, I didn't really acknowledge that it was around. For a lot of people now, still think mental illness or depression is a myth, and that's a myth that I want to want to get rid of. Uh, it's taboo to talk about it, um, because not really many people understand it. Not many people are aware um, of what it is. And that's what I really struggled with. I struggled massively with the fact that I was feeling a certain way and being a man, being a man that um, had that exterior of being tough. You know, rugby league is a, is a tough gig. You know, for me, I didn't fit the profile to be a rugby league player. I was 68 kilos ringing wet my first season. You know, so you can imagine how difficult it was for me and how hard I had to work. So for, for this thing we call depression to hit me, um, basically grab me by the scruff of the neck and drag me to the lowest point. I had no idea what I, what I had to do. I had, no, I had no idea what I was feeling or why I was going through what I was going through. Growing up, not just in my community, but in the rugby league community, there was, wasn't much awareness no education in school, in the footy family, no education around what we need to look out for, uh, whether it's in ourselves or whether it's in each other. And that's something I've learnt so much. And again, that's why I share my story so much because we are human beings. We all feel the same. You know, we're all affected the same. And if we don't deal with our feelings, whether they're good or bad, you could end up in a really bad place no matter how big or how small it is. For me, looking back, this one little change within my club 
was nothing compared to so many other things that happened out there. You know, we talked about uh, physical and emotional abuse. Um, we talk about people losing loved ones. We talk about people losing everything. Compared to me having a little change in my footy club, doesn't seem like much. But for me, it was a massive thing. And again, it was a hard thing for me to deal with. We had so many young people in Australia, not just Australia, globally, that struggle, that suffer with depression. And it's the reason why I tell my story. I'm open, I'm honest, and I, I know sometimes it can be raw, but I think that's the only way we should be. Um, I think we lack that honesty, that communication that we need. Some of our leaders lack that. Um, I see myself as a person that could change that. Communication is one of the most important things in today's society. No matter what area you're in. I mean, we're all adults here, we know this. I played footy. If we didn't communicate, we got smashed. It's the same in the workplace. I'm in a real job now, so I'm going to work three or, three or four times harder. But even in the workplace, communication is very, very important. No communication, things just run awry. Um, communication, I'm not just talking about the things that we talk about every day. You know, we, it's idle chit chat for, for most of us. You know, we could talk about the weather. You know, that's a fact. You know, it's, it's a beautiful day outside. We're in cliches, we talk about cliches, and we have our own opinions. And that's usually what we do to open a conversation. And we stick with that. But we neglect to talk about the things that are most important, that underlay that. What we feel and what we need. I know sometimes we struggle to, to know what we need because we don't let people know how we feel. And that's something I'm, I'm, when I do go around to talk, whether they're men or whether they're women, whether they're child or whether they're older, it's important that we are honest in the way we talk. And we shouldn't be ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed of it. I know I've helped many people because I've been able to share my story the way I do. You know, um, it's no secret that I'm very, very passionate in this area. I get even more passionate the more I travel, the more I share my journey, realising how big this beast, if you want, for lack of a better way of putting it, depression or mental illness is in our communities, not just our Indigenous communities. It's a struggle that we can only do we can only beat together. You know, especially in our communities. We talk about closing gap, physical and mental health. I think we could, before we can close the gap with mental and physical, we need to close the gap between each other. You know, obviously, actions of the past um, have given us struggles that we, we are having difficulty with. Now, we, we're talking about healing today. And for me, healing is all about acknowledgement and accepting. And I know for some people that is very, very hard. It's easy for me to say, I didn't live back in the past. But I still see the, the issues that are going on today. Talk about the stolen generation. My dad was a big part of that. I mean, he didn't get, he didn't get taken from, from the parents. He, he sort of wandered off. He went on walkabouts and nobody could find him. But whilst he was gone, his brothers and sisters were taken. And I myself, and he didn't realise how much of an impact that it would have on him in the later life. But my dad is still struggling with that. He's struggling massively with it. He and my mother parted back in 1996. Dad struggled a couple of years before 1996, and he is still struggling. You know, my dad's my hero. I want to be able to help my dad. So if it means that I talk in front of people like yourselves, if it means that I have to be open, I have to be honest, and I have to be raw about it, that's what I, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. 
Um, I learned so much about myself, obviously, during this journey. The more I talk about it, the more I learn. Um, for me, culture wasn't really a big thing. I come from the Northern Tablelands, and um, yeah, we were put on, the mob were put on missionaries, they were put on um, reserves, if you want to call it that. Um, so we, we didn't really, I myself didn't grow up with anybody that could pass anything down, whether it was language, dance, or song. You know, so for me, um, I really didn't have strength in that area. Because later on, um, obviously with my footy career, I was able to travel around the place, and in particular now that I've retired, I do a lot of work in communities. Um, I've learned so much more about myself because communities up north, far north Queensland, uh, western New South Wales, down south in Victoria, have, have allowed me to come into communities and not only that, share their culture with me. And it's something that's beautiful and it's something that I've, I've taken a lot of strength from. And it's something that is very important to know about yourself, know about where you come from um, and who you are is one of the most powerful things that you can have. That way you know yourself, pretty much anything else doesn't really matter all that much. And that's a, that's a message I like to get across to a lot of people. You know, to, one, to know oneself is, is one of the most powerful things that you get out of. When, when you talk about power, we don't have any yet right now. As in Indigenous peoples, we don't have power right now. I mean, we're working hard in different areas, whether politics, in communities, health, schooling, education. We are working hard to get there, but we still don't have that power that I know we can get to. That I know we can make a big difference to, not just in Australia, but worldwide. Um, can I just leave you with a quote that I love to live by? Uh, it's probably from one of the most amazing minds ever, you know, Albert Einstein. And he's one guy uh, you probably wouldn't expect this from because they, they spoke about him as being crazy, really. But he put it in perspective for myself, and I didn't really understand what it meant at first. Um, but again, with all the journeys and all the travelling that I've done, it really sort of resonates with me. Um, he once said that to live life for someone else is a life worth living. And I think that just brings it all back in. And for a long time, for many years, that's how our people lived. We lived for each other. And we still do in many ways. But there are things that are, certain things that are disconnecting us from that. We are a beautiful culture, one of the most beautiful cultures in the world. We're all about each other. We're all about people. And it's, that's a quote that I think that a lot of us should be able to live by. Thank you. Makatang Najang, Marambarang Indigi, Miriel. Makatang Najang, Makatang Najang, Makatang Najang. I want to thank the mother for allowing me to be here today, protecting me and providing for me, and to be able to talk to you about what healing is from my perspective. I would also like to pay respect to Uncle Chika and for his lovely welcome to country, and also pay respect to the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, for this is their country that we stand on today. I would also like to acknowledge Anita Heiss, Richard Weston, Justin Files, Preston Campbell and Joan Dixon. My name is Shondell Bolt and I'm a proud Aboriginal woman who belongs to the Yuan Nation of the South East Coast of New South Wales. I have ancestry connection to the Dharawal, Wadi Wadi, Tomikim Wandandian, Walbanja, Monero Nagarigo clans and the Victorian clan Yatmatung. Today I'm going to talk to you about my understanding of healing and I'll be covering three different personal perspectives. Law, L-O-R-E, culture and spirituality, and a possible way forward for our people. When I think about healing and what it means to me, oddly enough, I think about my own mental health and my capacity to survive, and I ask myself questions like, what do I understand about my culture? And how does that help me to heal? What does healing truly mean to me? 
I think about my understanding of how do I heal from a depressive state of mind. What do I need to do to feel in control of my life? I begin to think about my cultural understanding. And if I revive what was once in my being from the beginning of my time, I look for a spiritual connection to myself. I begin to talk myself through the despair. And I believe that I can truly be healed and empowered to reach my full potential. When I think about today's society and what it means to heal, we often revert to a Western style of counselling and think that those who are troubled with grief, trauma or depression often need to seek medicine in the formation of a tablet and commence counselling from a clinician. But what if all we are looking for is someone to listen and to teach us that the answers lie within? In 2007, I lost my brother and I became an alcoholic because I was burdened with grief. I began to self-harm through the abuse of binge drinking. I didn't understand why I was feeling so broken or so troubled and grieved by my own pain. I had always considered myself as a strong spiritual person and often I would receive different messages from my ancestors through my own dreaming. However, when I was drinking, my messages were not received and I began to fall deeper and deeper into my own darkness. After I brought myself to terms with my grief and spent time with my elders, I started to think in a healed state of mind. I thought about my own law. And law for me is a set of rules. It's connection to the self and the connection to the ancestors. It is about a knowledge system, a learning. It is about a collective wisdom that is passed on through oral history and songline. Law is a way of being. It is a state of mind. It is our connectedness to the physical and spiritual worlds and to the creator. Some might say law is a set of customary traditional rules that allow us to become one with the land and the flesh self. But I believe law is about the existence of who we are as a people. It is about our stories and our dreaming. It is about the rules we must keep and we must hand down our knowing so that we empower those that look up to us. Last week, I had the opportunity to sit and talk to one of my elders. Uncle Stan Grant said, power is in the language. Learning our culture and our language is what makes us who we are today. So the question is, how do we get others to address their issues? How do we adapt to a different way of counselling? We often think about counselling the mind, but we need to think about counselling the spirit of our people. When we are damaged, we, are, we abuse ourselves and we can become addicts through our abuse and addiction, whether it be drug abuse or alcohol abuse, physical abuse, domestic or family violence or self-harm. We don't recognise that we have a pain and we shadow that pain with self-destruction. But let's ask ourselves, how do we remove addiction? How do we stop drug and alcohol abuse so we stop or prevent drug-induced psychosis and schizophrenia or self-harm? So we can address the core problems that haunt us? How do we stop the darkness overshadowing our being? The, the solution could be very simple. We replace the addiction of drug and alcohol abuse with another addiction. We replace it with a spiritual and cultural revitalisation. Through my healing journey, this was a powerful transition for me and it helped me to realise the light within me and the ability to heal my own scars. One of my uncles, Bob Brown, told me that anger is a bad thing. If we carry anger, we can't heal and we can't reconcile. He then went on to talk about what was, what is and what will be and that we will always be an Aboriginal person. We have survived and we continue to survive. If we figure out questions like who am I, where am I heading, what is my true purpose in life, if we know this and we accept where we have come from, we begin to transcend back to our original knowing of who we are and it gives us our own identity. If there is one thing I've learnt about healing, it is accepting the past and knowing that we must move on and not carry anger 
because we become unstable and unhappy and we don't become the people who we are destined to be. We are not humble. We become hateful to ourselves and to others. When we are grieved by our own hurts and ashamed of who we have become, we are faced with anxiety, grief, trauma and depression. When I think of the damage oppression, dispossession and colonisation has played on my people, I understand that we are a damaged people, but we are not broken. We in ourselves know we can fix ourselves. We just need that space, that cultural space that is understood. If we introduce yarning circles for our men and women and youth and create a cultural safe place, we begin to start a movement and people begin to become empowered and listen to the message. We have to instill a respect to the mother so that we may live of her and feed from her, draw our inner strength from her. For the mother is our provider. All that are living beings feed from her, for she is the host of humanity. It is our duty to instill power amongst ourselves so that we can instill unity amongst our people. We have to listen to those song lines because our ancestors are continuously sending messages and we become more connected and have that sense of self-pride and become truly happy with who we are destined to become. I believe that is what is healing. We have to stop the use of oppressive language that we use today, like the word blackfella. Should we really be using this word? Because I believe and was taught that it wasn't used as a term of endearment, but it was used to label Aboriginal people in a derogative way. We have become so indoctrined and accepting of how we are treated and we treat people like they treat us and we carry a sickness within us, like hate or anger. We have to empower Aboriginal people to move past the trauma and grief. We have to teach others to look for alternative healing modalities. We need to recognise every community is different and we need to share and have the same vision. Our communities have to lead the discussions, talk openly about, sorry, talk openly about what are the issues and what is the trauma that are holding themselves back. We need to look at how we can help our men, women, children, young people, grandparents and aunts and uncles. We need to build strong relationships, firstly with ourselves, with our communities and with this nation. Aboriginal healing occurs through finding a connectedness with culture and spiritual belonging to land. It is a personalised journey that involves the individual to be whole and to be able to revive what was once a basic understanding of existence through language, kin, land and cultural practices. Once we have given the right to self-reflect on the experience in a cultural safe place, we begin to cre create a new understanding of the self and what it means to be whole. We have stories that are from the beginning of time, which is our connection to our, our dreaming. We are a proud people. We are the first people. We are the first people of the first sunrise. If we begin to walk in a different way, we walk in a way that we showcase a true understanding of who we are. We walk with pride and the identity, identity that is connected to the soul and the spirit of ourselves and the mother. There is a saying, reach for the stars, that I say, search for the star inside yourself, which is your own spirit, and it will lead you to your old people who will show you your way and make you shine. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Anita. Um, and thank you, Uncle Chica, for that warm welcome. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we meet on here today, the Gadikul of the Eora Nation, uh, but also to uh, all our webinar um, participants that have uh, kind of um, joined us today as well. So on all those traditional lands, um, uh, I pay my respects uh, to all the traditional custodians there. Um, as Anita's mentioned, I'm a Barkindji man, so uh, Barkindji meaning river people. Um, I'm a, uh, a proud Barkindji descendant of a grandmother who has 110 descendants on the earth, um, of which I'm number 16th 
descendant. Um, and of course, very close to my grandmother, um, who as a young boy would uh, take me up and down the river uh, to meet with our elders. Um, so uh, I've been fortunate to be able to connect to our, our kinship uh, laws and our culture uh, back along that Darling River. And of course today, uh, even my own family, they, they'll ask, well, how are we connected to uh, so-and-so? Um, and all I need to know is uh, who the grandparents are and I'm able to uh, connect them into our kinship system, um, which I'm very fortunate for. Um, I guess uh, the other thing about uh, belonging to a large extended family, um, and I'm fortunate enough to be, uh, I guess, um, very close to my grandmother, um, but of course she has a lot of unconditional love for all of her descendants. Um, so uh, throughout all of their different distressors that they experience, um, she'll always be there for them. And uh, being close to her, um, I've learnt through that life experience uh, how important it is for us to um, uh, be uh, as strong as we can and hold up that strength uh, for our family, our community, um, uh, to ensure that um, uh, they find some strength in you to move forward also. It does become daunting when you're doing um, kind of, or when you're focusing on uh, single uh, family members. Um, and of course, with a large extended family, uh, you, do co you do go from one trauma to another um, uh, because uh, there are a lot of um, distresses that we've heard about uh, from previous speakers uh, today um, that are prevalent in the majority of our um, community and our families. Um, and so I guess I've been fortunate enough to, to work with an Aboriginal community controlled health organisation who focus on the primary health care um, delivery model, uh, which means going out into the community and uh, working with our mob um, uh, to support them around managing their health care. And of course, that also gives us a lot of links with our community and a lot of uh, conversations are had with our, uh, our workforce around what our people would like to see happen um, uh, as an Aboriginal health um, uh, service provider. So through those discussions with our community, the community were talking a lot about healing and ensuring that uh, we have a healing program that focuses on culture because for our people uh, our, our strength is in culture and when we learn uh, and grow um, from life experience with those traditional cultural values, um, uh, we, we can draw that strength from that. And then of course through this adaptation process of this changing environment around us uh, within, uh, I guess, modern society, we are challenged uh, by different stimuli, by uh, different ideas, uh, whether that's uh, from Western ideals through common law um, that governs uh, our communities, or whether that's uh, through uh, different cultural perspectives from um, uh, living in a uh, melting pot of different cultures. Um, and so what we did with that information is uh, we've been lucky enough to have a relationship with the University of New South Wales um, that, uh, and discussions started uh, around evolving our own healing program, but to ensure that we have our own evidence uh, that relates back to our communities and, and not look at the evidence uh, alone of what uh, is out there internationally um, from uh, different trauma-informed um, research. And so uh, it's about six years ago now, we embarked on um, 
a qualitative research uh, with our community. And the rationale around doing the qualitative in the first instance was so that we could engage with our community, so that we could listen to what our community had to say about uh, what they thought the issues were. But also um, to capture um, the things that they thought were the solutions uh, to how we could move forward um, uh, in terms of healing. And so in that information, in the qualitative phase of that study, uh, we were able to hear a lot of the di distresses that our community were experiences and, uh, experiencing, and uh, Joan mentioned uh, many of them today, um, uh, just in terms of the uh, substance abuse, uh, domestic violence, uh, sexual and physical abuse of adults and children, and so all of which are impacting on our community, and so we were very uh, honoured that our community shared so freely this information, and it wasn't uh, an easy task uh, to be able to have those conversations. Um, we, in our first instance, we spoke to the service providers so that they could give us some scenarios, some vignettes about what it was uh, that they were uh, being exposed to as service providers in our community. And so uh, out of that, we were able to engage uh, a local <coughs> Aboriginal um, a woman uh, to do some drawings, some paintings for us so that we could use images to start those conversations with our community um, that talked about the different uh, distressors that community were experiencing. One that uh, comes to mind was uh, a vignette that uh, we had about uh, a, a character named Granny Green, where uh, it de depicted a grandmother holding the hands, the picture uh, depicted a grandmother holding the hands of two children while the, the mother of the children was heading off down the road with the purse in her hand. And, it was very interesting because every single community person that we spoke to recognised that scenario. They knew exactly what was going on for that uh, particular family because they had been experiencing that there in their own families. Uh, whether they were male, female, it didn't matter. Uh, they all recognised it. The interesting thing was there was a bit of uh, language that was used from uh, both men and women that were different in the way they described it. Um, and uh, what we've done uh, in the far west, uh, we've had uh, a kind of bit of a movement around um, male violence against women. And so a lot of our women um, uh, had engaged in previous uh, education and training uh, with people from the Education Centre Against Violence. And so they evolved their own language and were able to use the language that service providers were able to use. But our men were, were not. They didn't have that language to describe it. Um, and the way that they would describe it was uh, very, um, I guess, uh, personalised in the way they uh, described it because it was either their sister experiencing it or... Um, their daughter was doing it um, with their wife um, or so forth. So I guess just in the evolution of the, the healing program, uh, it's really important to say that we knew we needed a healing program. Our community were telling us that we needed a healing program, but the world was evolving um, different healing programs as well. Our research showed that uh, the healing programs that were popping up uh, around the globe um, were basically a, a couple of days um, where community members would come along, share the different uh, distresses that they're facing or the issues that they'd been facing, and then there was no follow-through and no follow-up um, with those participants. And so um, the way in which we've structured our healing program is to ensure that um, I guess firstly that we're providing a space for our community who are living everyday distress um, to have the space to be able to reflect on what is going on in their life.
But the other thing is, and uh, Richard mentioned it at the beginning, in terms of healing, it's really important to acknowledge the distress that people are experiencing. And so, in evolving our healing program, and I must pay respects to all our uh, Aboriginal researchers uh, who are local Indigenous people from our communities that have been able to decipher the information out of the data that we've been collating um, from the qualitative research, they were able to put together uh, a bit of a big picture, if you like, um, where we use in symbolism the river, because the river is very important to us. And I, I did uh, kind of forget to say that uh, the name of our healing program is the Kalpi Barka Mirica uh, healing program, which means clear river ahead. And so in that program, we look at the adaptation process and how for our participants uh, best we can describe um, the adaptation process of what is happening for Aboriginal people. So we talk about pre-colonisation as a successful adaptation of Aboriginal culture. And for 40 plus thousand years, our ancestors have been able to adapt to a changing in environment, uh, including coming in and out of an ice age. And so uh, we know that by drawing on the strength from our ancestors that we are a culture that can adapt to change of environment. We also talk about the colonisation process and all the different traumas that our families have experienced intergenerationally and uh, whether that's through past policies of our government um, with the forced removal um, from our traditional homelands onto missions, reserves, or uh, being taken from our um, families and being raised by uh, institutions. And so the different uh, distressors or traumas that we've experienced, we acknowledge that through the healing program. The healing program is spread out over six weeks. So every couple of weeks, uh, well, there's four sessions that they go through first where they hone in on some of the more distressing issues, whether that be violence or whether that be um, uh, kind of other distressors. But we also know that the connection to country is really important. And so we finish our healing program with a camp where we return to country, where we go back out bush and we reconnect that point is a very pivotal point because what we're trying to work with our community on is acknowledging the traumas, showing that this is what's happening, drawing strength from our cultural learning, from our ancestors, but at the same time providing space for individuals so that they can then make a choice to move forward once the healing program has come to an end at the camp, making choices about whether they want to tap into current service providers or whether they just want to make some changes in their lives about some of the behaviours that they might have. Uh, one that springs to mind is people might, some of our male participants might choose to walk their children to school um, as a change to healing and start to connect with their families in those ways. So I guess in terms of the, the healing program that we've evolved, um, there is a really important, I guess, uh, process that we're going through and the way we're evolving it. And that is so that that program can be handed over to our community also, so that our community can uh, pick up the healing program and do it in their backyards or go down to the river when they're fishing and uh, talk about this with their community. And this is partly because or mostly because we want our community to heal. We want to reach out as far as we can. As a service provider, uh, we are limited in terms of um, uh, requiring community to engage with us. but 
through this healing program and tapping into that desire from our community to reconnect with culture, we're building in some of those steps that are able to support our mob to move forward on uh, their healing journey. And of course, uh, I'd just like to finish with the, the, the program is around self-determination. It is about Aboriginal people uh, taking the responsibility but uh, being accountable for our own healing as well. And we're the only people that can do it. Uh, we can't expect other people uh, to uh, provide our healing for us. As individuals, as families, as a community, as a nation, to heal, we need to be able to take that responsibility and uh, be self-determining in our way forward. Thank you. We're coming to that time of the day. Now we're going to do some questions from the floor. There are roving mics for people to have questions. We've got a few questions that have come online. Um, the first one to the panel um, is from Joanne, and she says, I want to recognise Aboriginal people who live in urban areas of Australia. Is healing yourself through culture different in an urban context? Which is a really good question given mm. that 32% of our people live in urban areas. The greatest population of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are in Greater Western Sydney. So who would like to attack that question first? Is it different? Uh, thanks for that question, Joanne. Um, uh, I'd just like to say that uh, in terms of culture, um, for me, uh, it's a value within you and innate within Aboriginal mm. people and the way that we're, we're raised from children, um, from infants through to adolescence into adulthood. And uh, growing with those cultural values, uh, uh, the connection is around your relationships uh, with people and the environment around you, I believe. Um, I mean, one of the ways that uh, we describe uh, to a lot of our new health um, uh, workers that come into our organisation is that they may look at a family that's walking down the main street um, of Broken Hill and they may see a 12-year-old uh, child walking with a 5-year-old child and uh, a lot of uh, non-Indigenous people would look at that and they would say, well, that's neglectful from the adult population that uh, they've left children on their own. Whereas in our Aboriginal culture, we look at that and we can see that our culture is still alive by looking at that example because that's a mentoring process happening with uh, the 12-year-old and the 5-year-old and that's their connection happening um, around exploration of that environment around them as well. Unfortunately, in the changing environment, there's a whole lot more kind of stimuli and dangers um, uh, that we're unaware of, and uh, namely motor vehicles and whatnot. But um, I would say uh, it's around that innate uh, cultural value that you grow with, um, that you connect with and connect with the people around you. Are the panellists are nodding? Does anybody else like to add anything to that? Yeah. Um, Chantel? Joanne, I just want to say that um, I think everybody has culture. It doesn't matter where you are or, um, you know, what part of the world or what part of Australia you live in. There's some sort of connection that we, we all have um, to the self and, and, and to um, a spiritual culture as well. So it doesn't matter, um, yeah, where you're living. I think it's just... What is your culture? Um, what is your understanding of your, your Aboriginal um, culture, your Aboriginality? Um, and it doesn't hurt to ask. It just means that you're hungry to know um, and you want to learn um, about that. It doesn't mean you're less <clears throat> Aboriginal because you don't know, um, because that's, um, that's, yeah, that's kind of rubbish, I think. <laughs> I think, I think the most important thing to remember, I mean, Justin just said it, the um, relationship is the most appropriate word, I think. Um, I think a relationship is the reason why Indigenous people live so long on this country. Um, and with a relationship, obviously, well, what is a relationship? That's a question to you guys. <laughs> See, we, we, we kind of lack what 
a relationship really means. For me, relationship is a two-way street. So for Indigenous people, for example, um, their relationship with, with the land was they gave respect, they were responsible for it, <coughs> and in return, the land gave them sustainability, everything they needed to be able to live. And that, to me, is a relationship, a two-way street. And it's important, it doesn't matter whether you live out in the country, out in the bush, in the desert, or whether you're in, in the city, relationship, whether it's between another person or whether it's between, between the land, is very, very important. Always remember, relationship always has to work two ways for it to work properly. Today, um, whether it's in the, in the city or whether it's out in, in the bush, relationships basically a one-way street. A lot of people are give me, give me, give me, give, give, hands out, where they don't really give too much back. And that's where the breakdown is. Relationships are two-way street, and I think that's the most important, appropriate word that we should be using. My spelling was way off for all of those things. Um, we have a question from Michael, which actually came in early, very quite early in the conversation. In a time where young people are more and more finding themselves between two worlds, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, with different and sometimes contrasting pressures, what is needed to support positive, strength-based mental health and healing for our young mob? I'd, I'd probably take the opportunity to answer that because I've had that question from my 23-year-old son and he's going to kill me for saying this. Um, however, he's had that difficulty in, in having being asked what is um, an Aboriginal person and how do I how do you identify and what does it mean to be an Aboriginal person um, having uh, a non-Aboriginal parent? And he brought it back to the accepting both parts of his heritage and acknowledging the strengths that both parts of his heritage had given him. He's able to use the values that... Um, as an Aboriginal woman, I've been able to place on him around family and connecting to your mob to keep him strong and to put him through those hard times that he's had to endure. And he, like Preston, has had that um, the black dog sort of following him around for some time. And as a young man, it's been... Um, difficult to acknowledge that you're going through that process. But he makes me so proud at the fact that not only does he say, I'm a proud Aboriginal man, but I'm also proud of the, her the other heritage that I have. And he's, he says, first and foremost, that he's George and that he has... Um, this heritage that enables him to um, benefit from a range of different life experiences. So I think that's probably a good, well, the, the best answer I can give. Great practical example. Is it okay if we move on to the next question? Just conscious of time. Um, so thank you, Michael. I hope that helped. Uh, Janine from Snake asks a question to Joan. Uh, your intergenerational trauma program, the community tools you mentioned, can you give us an example of what has been implemented from the community that is working? Uh, Janine, one of the things that we have done is have the young people as part of the yarning circle lead those yarning circles and set the theme um, for each of the sessions. What we have done is used... Um, some of the knowledge that has been um, gathered um, with our elders and enabled young people to participate and lead um, um, smoking ceremonies, um, bring back some of the cultural um, um, practices that had been lost to a lot of the communities. Um, we, as a community, have a number of people that live in um, Burke that come from different tribal areas and, and cultural groups. And so those young people have used the, the tools of the Barkindji people 
to or the practices of the Barkindji people to explore their own cultural heritage, um, explore their own mob, find out who their mob are and um, make sure that they are able to document that and put it in a way that's meaningful to them and to other young people that um, are in the class. Now these classes are mixed classes. They are Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal kids. So it's not, not just for the Aboriginal kids at Burke High School and, and Bawana Central School. It's for all Year 7 and 8. And the engagement and the respect that's in the room is quite um, powerful. Awesome. We've got, thank you for that answer. Uh, we've got a question from Sally to Preston. Can you tell us how sport can help our mental health? Um, Please. Sport is a, well, a lot of people associate with sport. You know, rugby league is massive in New South Wales and Queensland. I myself see value in sport as a vehicle. Um, for me, the reason I, I'm so welcome in the communities and I get that foot in the door is because, well, I was a professional footballer. They see me on TV every week. Um, so that allows us to get the foot in the door. So we get it here, you know. But with that, the, the, the right messages or the important messages need to be, need to be right. Um, but I see rugby league in particular in Queensland and New South Wales as being that, the driving force that can make a big difference in mental health. Um, I myself, uh, in the last year and a half, um, have gone around all the NRL clubs and NYC clubs to speak about my story and my journey. Given we had, in 2013, we had two young boys from the under-20s competition take their own lives. Um, and just earlier this year, we had four that took their lives. Um, so it's, it's, it's massive in, in the rugby league um, circles. Um, I think it's important that, like I said, people see us on TV every week. So they generally feel like they know us. To give us that open door... And to be able to get across and give the messages that we need to get, get across, um, that's why I, where I see um, sport being, being, being powerful. I mean, it's, saying that it's the same in, in anything in society. You know, you have your really good leaders and your not so good leaders. Um, it's just trying to find out who them good leaders are. Um, yes, they are good footballers, but do they have the messages that our young people need or that our communities need? I don't, I don't know sometimes. Um, my question is an open question to the panel. Um, and it may be a difficult question, I don't know, but I, I seek an answer. I work with a very special group of men um, who are stolen generations men. And I hear a lot of, I cannot connect to culture, I cannot connect to culture. My, my, my question is how do we reconnect the Stolen Generations people, not be it just men but men and women, back to cultural traditions when many don't even know their own origins, when many are not even still accepted by their traditional communities and their families, and given that the culture they were brought up with was a culture of violence and sexual abuse in the institutes that they were incarcerated in. I was going to say that's another webinar. But <laughs> off <you> go. <laughs> um, I think that um, when we talk about culture and we talk about, um, you know, from a strength-based approach, we have to share what we know. That means our men and women's groups that are operating, we have to be able to give the opportunity to showcase and to invite, you know, people like, um, you know, um, those men that you're working with. Um, and I think that, you know, we talked about it earlier today. It's about communication, it's about respect, and it's about um, sharing what we know works um, and trying to um, revive someone's cultural being in a, in a cultural safe place um, and, and trying um, to be able to have those people sit and be able to share their stories um, in in a space that's culturally safe. And I think that that's, we don't do that often enough. We, we hold on to our programs because we're, um, you know, we don't get funded enough or we don't have enough room. But if we can sh 
culturally show and unite together that we are, you know, all united and we share a shared vision, then I think that's where we have to start. How many times have we met somebody that we are related to but had no idea that they were related? We had six degrees of separation a long time before the movie came out. <laughs> um, it's just unbelievable about how many people that I've, I've come along to know or see that they're, they're related to me. You know, they might live far north Queensland, far west in Australia, but I'm related to them. I'll go back to acceptance. It's a massive thing. You need to accept where, you, where you're at, accept what has happened in the past. And I know for some, it is very, very difficult for that. But until that acceptance is there, they're not going to learn too much about themselves. And we talk about sharing, you know. We are a beautiful culture, like I said before, and it's all about sharing. It shouldn't have to be from where, where you were born, you know. People in some communities are very, very welcoming, very, very willing to share their culture with you. It's something, it's a beginning. And then with stories, with your journey, you can connect somewhere. It's, it's just going to happen sometime. It just happens. You could be on the other side of the world and run into a family member. Mm -hmm. So acceptance is a, is, a, is a major thing that we need to come to terms with. And until then, um, you're going to be stuck in that little bubble. You know? They talk about not, not being able to learn culture. They're already living culture. The fact that they're getting together in a men's group, a gathering, that is our culture. We talk about our problems or we talk about meaning, meaningful things. I mean, they're not getting together and getting on the drink, are they? They're getting together, trying to learn together. That is culture. Um, look, thanks. Thanks, Anita. We, um, we do have some gifts for our panellists and we'll, we'll give them to you shortly. Um, I just want to say that... Um, just how moving and uh, how, how uh, engaged, engaging that conversation was, and Joni, the, the 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 stark reality of the the statistics that affect our daily lives that you presented um, was, uh, you know, really brings us back to earth and brings us back to the challenges that we face. And and Preston, your, your the story of your journey, um, you know, someone who's gone from being a high profile uh, sports um, sporting figure um, and to talk about that struggle that you had I mean um, there's things in that story that people would not have imagined um, and Shondell fantastic um, conversation about your healing journey and what healing means to you and uh, I really um, like the uh, idea of counselling our spirits I think that's that's fantastic and Justin um, who I used to work with as a colleague out in far, far west, as you, you say, um, but beautiful country out there, Muddy Parky region and, and Barkindji land out on Darling River and uh, just the story of that healing program that did start several years ago but is now coming to fruition and just that it is locally owned, locally designed and, um, and the, the idea that we have to take responsibility for our healing. It's, no one can do it for us. We have to, to um, go on that journey. Um, and the question from the audience here about um, stolen generations and what that challenge is, and that was a really tough question because I don't know that there's an answer there yet for us, but I do know that um, one of the things that we can do in our communities is to acknowledge the experience of stolen generations um, and try to understand it and try to um, hear those stories, as, and some of them are... Uh, more horrendous than others and the experiences are different. Um, but we have seen through some of our work in the Healing Foundation, working with stolen generations of people starting to make some movement. Um, but I think there's a challenge in for our, us as a people. As, um, one of the issues you mentioned was people not being welcomed back to their traditional lands and how I see that as a fantastic opportunity for healing um, ceremony or healing process that can take place where people can be welcomed back home and we may we may not be able to reconnect with our culture but certainly as the panelists said we are aboriginal people or we are torres strait island people and um uh you know just the fact that those men are coming together and starting to and talking about the challenges and the issues they face and their experiences that is 
a cultural response to those issues. Um, I want to thank this, um, our online audience, I think, might still be with us. So thank you very much for sticking it out and thank you for the uh, people that turned up today. Please join us outside for a cup of tea and uh, uh, a biscuit, I think, hope, hopefully. We can afford that. Um, and thanks again, um, Uncle Chica, for the, the fantastic welcome to Gadigal country and uh, it, it really is a privilege to be on this land. And although I have Torres Strait heritage, I was actually born here in Sydney on, on Gadigal country. So... I'm not a Gaddical person, but I think I'm a citizen of your country, hopefully. <laughs> but uh, thank you, everyone, and um, thanks, Anita, for a great job. Cheers.